Hello YouTube, D. Baudry here. Um, so I've got a bunch of stuff to cover in this video and I'm also going to add a little bit more content to them, namely parts, what they are. Uh, I'm not going to talk about them in great detail, uh, just enough so that you know what they are and you know what the part numbers are if you want to look them up and to then go research what they do more, have fun. Um, certainly not going to talk to the engineers, I just want to be able to express good components and good designs versus lesser components versus bad designs, things like that. So by expressing the parts and their values, I can kind of show a little bit more about that. Um, but really my goal here is to reach the people who don't know about electronics and therefore can be deceived into buying something that's junk versus something that's good. Um, and some of that has to do with the components they use, some of it has to do with the way things are designed, uh, you know, the way parts are laid out, things like that. So I'm going to uh, add that in here to try to help those people more and to at the same time add a little bit more technical value to these teardowns I do. So anyway, this is the board uh, close up that belongs to a Vetter, uh, Benjamin Vetter, designed by him directly, uh, 100 250 motor controller. And right now you are looking at the MOSFETs. So these packages, these are called a D2 pack. That's just the, st the style or design of this MOSFET package. Uh, and they are specifically Infineon, which is an excellent brand, by the way. Uh, if you don't respect Infineon, I'm just wondering who you are. Uh, but they're IRF7769 MOSFETs, a 100 volt part, uh, rated for 375 amps. They probably will never see that because that is a maximum, not a continuous. Uh, the D2 pack, because all the circuitry is on the back side of the part and the heat sinking is on the top of the part, uh, that means you can use both sides of the board, uh, which means that uh, you can get a lot more electronics packed together in a tight space and that is definitely one of the advantages here because this is literally everything on the controller all in a single board that's smaller than my hand. Um, whereas like if you use the tall package, T-O-L-L, -L, like what is used in say like Shul controllers or uh, EBMX's X9000 or like the KO Moto controllers, um, those ones, the uh, circuit paths um, out of the MOSFET and the heat path is all one and the same. So you literally solder the MOSFET down and you solder it down to a metal back board um, and that metal back board only allows you to have one layer of circuitry and that's on its surface, that's it. Because uh, the moment you make it multi-layer you have created a resistance path for heat in which case the MOSFETs don't stay cool. So yeah, for the tall package uh, you have the limitation of single-sided circuit boards and only on the surface Whereas the D2 pack, uh, you can have multi-layer boards, uh, you can have circuitry on both sides of the board, and then you're going to do the heat sinking on this top surface of them. So they both have advantages, they both have disadvantages. The tall package probably has better thermal paths, and it probably has, well, I know it has better current carrying capability. Um, so it's got those advantages, but the D2 pack has got the uh, multi-layer and things like that, you know, better, tighter integration of componentry advantage. So it just kind of depends what your design needs are for which one you might use. And you can certainly port more than six of these guys in a single uh, phase if you need more current carrying capability, if 250 amps isn't enough for you. Okay, so um, yeah, you can see right here, that's the battery plus wire. On the other side of the board is where battery minus is. Each one of these sets of phases has its own power bus because battery plus and battery minus goes to each one. So that simplifies things because you don't need to have a big copper bus across the whole thing. Um, and of course, uh, there are uh, vias underneath like where the solder is and goes through a piece of copper that comes out to the MOSFETs too. And so, you know, like the, 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 uh, the phase bus, that's all inside the board as well. And there's vias from underneath the MOSFETs to that. And you can see like right here, see all those little tiny dots on there. Uh, you know, those are little holes basically that are copper filled. Um, and they connect the traces or, you know, large areas, squares of copper inside the board to the copper on the surfaces to tie all that stuff together. And that's under all the MOSFETs and things like that. So there's plenty of current path here. This is, this is a very, very tightly integrated, uh, all built into the board. 
uh, design, no need for external copper on the board beyond the circuit traces because it's inside and outside, both sides. Yeah, and it's also a very, very short current pass. You know, from the from the wire to here, which is like your longest distance, is an inch. You know, it's really, really short current pass. So, um, yeah, uh, the losses inside here are negligible, <laughs> to say the least. All right, let's move over here. Uh, I'm just going to talk about these just for a quick second and flip the board over. So those three guys right there, uh, they are current sensing chips. And I'm going to flip the board over for a second. So, uh, yeah, you can see them. So these guys right here, these are uh, highly precision, high current resistors for all intents and purposes. They're called a shunt. Um, but each one of them is five thousandth of an ohm, and you got three of them in parallel per phase. And uh, because they are a very precision value of resistance, you can use Ohm's law to calculate for current. So you measure the voltage across them, you know what the resistance is, and that's what these little guys do. So uh, they kind of serve three purposes. Uh, they do clean up because phases are kind of noisy. Um, they read the voltage across those current sensors and they do some magical math and they make digital ones and zeros to send off to the STM32. So anyway, those little parts, they are, where they are, there they are. So those are INA240s. Um, they are called an ultra precise current sense amplifier. <laughs> yeah, so they're basically measuring those shunts and telling the STM32 uh, 4 or H405 or F405 um, about what the phases are doing. And there is a current shunt for each one of the phases. This is pretty common to BESC. Uh, a little side note here, since I'm talking about the STM32 for a second. So uh, this is typical spin that comes off of KO Moto. Uh, those guys, they love to blow smoke about everything, and they claim that this is a vacuum cleaner CPU. That's their words, that's Christopher's words, that that is a vacuum cleaner CPU. Because the back 8000, I'm sorry, not the back 8000, but the eBMX X9000, uh, it uses the same CPU. It's an STM32 uh, H405, or F4, I'm sorry, STM32 F405, uh, uses the exact same CPU. It's extremely commonly used in VEST controllers that are truly FOC, field-oriented control. Uh, it's used across all of them. The STM32 gets used in a lot of things. Uh, it's a microcontroller chip. It gets used in CNC machines. It gets used in your car. Uh, yeah, <laughs> they're using a lot of stuff. It's a really popular it's a little CPU, really powerful little chip. Um, and yeah, a typical KO Moto spin. Uh, yeah, it's supposedly a vacuum cleaner CPU. Uh-huh. Sure, whatever, Chrissy. <clears throat> All right, I'm not going to talk about any of those small parts here. It's just resistors and capacitors and diodes. But I will move over here and talk about these guys. So uh, you effectively have three DC to DC converters here. Um, I've mentioned this before that really good designs do that. And, well, here you go. Thank you, Benjamin Vetter, for not skimping on any details anywhere. Um, you know, no linear regulators here. So... Uh, you've got two inductors, and you've got these two little chips right there, and they are made by Microchips, who I worked for back in the late 1980s, and that is an MCP-16311. Anyway, uh, they describe those as being a synchronous switch step-down regulator, <laughs> a.k.a. a buck converter. Um, this other guy right here, this big ear inductor, his chip is on the other side of the board, and I'll get to that in the other in that other chip in a minute, because we're about to flip anyway. Okay, so I've talked about all the stuff that's down here. Let's flip over. And we'll look at a phase. So there you go. Here's your phase wires coming out. Here's your battery minus bus coming in. You know, again, really efficient, really short current pass. Uh, if you want to call this a tortured current bath, man, <laughs> I can't imagine what a really not tortured one is to you, because there is no torturing here at all. Uh, from here to here is an inch. And, you know, the, you've got MOSFETs on one side. Uh, everything is really tightly integrated. You've got vias inside the board. You've got copper inside the board. You cannot get a tighter current path than this if you tried. I'm sure Benjamin Vetter is trying, but damn, this is really good. Um, these little ceramic caps, they are at the MOSFETs where they can do the absolute best good possible. Uh, yeah, uh, so they are there for high-frequency filtering. And as you can see, you've got a whole bunch of little ceramic caps all side by side. Literally, 
less than the thickness of the board away from the actual MOSFETs that they are doing the DC filtering for. Really, really, really close to where they're needed to be. Uh, you know, you've got the three current shunts, and again, underneath all this stuff, there's all kinds of vias that tie them together to the MOSFETs and tie them over to here. All this stuff is, you know, copper inside the board, copper on the surface, you know, lots and lots of good current paths from all that stuff uh, to make all those connections together without needing to add extra copper on the surface. All right, I'm, that's about all I'm going to talk about that. And as you can see, the three phases are exactly the same. So what I am going to do is shift this around a little bit. There we go. Uh, yeah, that'll do. Okay, oh, I need to get that a little bit more. There we go. That'll do it. Okay, so uh, these three chips right here, those are your gate driver chips, and those are TI parts, another Western company. And they are... Do, do, do I have them here somewhere? There we go. So those are UCC 27211s. They are a bridge gate driver. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's enough for everybody. Um, yeah, TI part. Next to that, uh, this little guy right here. So that is, I've used that little part myself when I need a kind of low amperage, pretty low amperage, a uh, little DC to DC buck converter. So it's good up to 140 volts and it can handle 400 milliamps. But uh, yeah, it's basically dropping battery voltage down to like 12 volts. And that other, in that inductor on the other side is the other piece of that equation. So three DC to DC converters, uh, probably this little guy right here is providing um, really stable 12 volts to those other two DC to DCs because, you know, there's some stuff on this board that needs 12 volts or some needs 5, some needs 3.3 volts. So, yeah, you've got three DC to DCs on here. This is the right way to do it, folks. Um, yeah, and, you know, this is typical for Benjamin. He doesn't skimp. He doesn't cut corners. All Western American whatever parts. Uh, I need to talk about the capacitors in a second, too, because um, those are also very good. Uh, I'm going to shift up here a little bit. There we go. So these guys right here, I couldn't look up this part number, I couldn't find it, but it says VEX on it. Uh, somebody else maybe can find it, but what these are is analog to digital converters. So a voltage, an analog signal comes in and it becomes ones and zeros out. And in this little connector right there, that's where your three, uh, you know, ADC one, two, and three are. So, you know, that's throttle, regen, braking, whatever else you use the third one for. But that's what those guys are. That's the DC, to, or that's the analog to digital converters for those three inputs. Uh, right here, this is a USB control chip, you know, basically taking USB signals and converting them into something STM32 can understand. You know, a little Western Bluetooth module. And the piece de la resistance. Uh, I didn't know what these were when I made the first video, but now I do. So you notice the little logo on here and the KXJ on there. So I had to look it up because I didn't recognize it off the top of my head. But that is American Chemicon. Yep. American made capacitors. <laughs> yeah. Another way that Benjamin Vetter did not skimp on anything. You even used a good name brand capacitor. You know, this is kind of the equivalent of Rubicons and Aishis, things like that. No Chinese parts in here anywhere. So good job, Benjamin. And folks, this is a good design. Uh, is there things that can be done better? Yes, there is. There's one thing in here that is not here that I wish there was. Um, so, you know, here's a phase right in this area is where there should be a temp sensor. There's not one there. Flip the board over. So, you know, here's your MOSFETs. No temp sensor. So, yeah, none of the phases have temp sensing at all. Uh, it is possible, and I don't know this is a fact, uh, maybe there's temp sensing in these guys. I know the STM32 has a temp sensor in it, but they're all in the wrong places to measure temperatures for the MOSFETs. So um, I know that people do have problems with these things blowing up sometimes, and I'll bet you anything it's thermal related. Um, or, you know, you just do stupid setup things that blow them up, but... I'll bet you anything, because there's no temp sensing on the 10250 that they probably burn out MOSFETs for that reason. They just go over temperature, and the uh, controller doesn't even know. Because there's no temp sensors here. I have looked and looked and looked over this board, and I can't find uh, any kind of a thermistor anywhere. So that's my thinking, and the only one is inside the STM32. So that's my one bitch. <laughs> no temp sensors. 